Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. Hello, PR Maven Nation. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, episode 222. Must be really lucky because it's all twos today. The podcast is presented by Marshall Communications, creator of the Marshall Plan 65-step strategic process. And for those of you new to the show, I'm Nancy Marshall, your host, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. And with me today is a special guest, Michael Katz, who's the chief penguin at blue penguin welcome to the pr maven podcast michael great to be here thanks for having me it's nice to have you too we were just reminiscing about how long we've known each other and it has been a long time although it was we figured out in this century so So, an award-winning humorist and former corporate marketer Blue Penguin founder and chief penguin, Michael Katz, specializes in coaching professional service firms and solos in improving their marketing. Since launching Blue Penguin in 2000, Michael has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Business Week Online, Bloomberg TV, Forbes.com, Inc.com, USA Today, and other national and local media, including the PR Maven podcast. (laughs) He is the author of four books and over the past 20 plus years has published more than 500 issues of the Likeable Expert Gazette, a twice twice monthly email newsletter and podcast with 6,000 passionate subscribers. I love that. They're passionate subscribers. They're not just regular (laughs) subscribers. They're passionate subscribers in over 40 countries around the world. Michael has an MBA from Boston University and a BA in psychology from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. He is a past winner of the New England Press Association Award for Best Humor Columnist. So I'm so happy to have you here today, Michael. It's good to be here. So tell us about your career and how you got into it in the first place. Yeah. Um well, it actually, I feel like my career had two parts. Up until I was like 40, I just had jobs and it was fine. Um, my last job, I was there for 12 years and it was also fine. Um, I worked at the cable company, so sorry. And uh, at some point, though, I started to realize a few things. One was that I'd kind of gone as far as I was going to go. Like I was OK. You know, I was like your basic middle manager in a, in a huge company. But. I realized that, yeah, I'm never going much beyond that. Um, I also felt like this is okay. I was in marketing in the company, but I wasn't really doing anything I was particularly good at. I mean, any of a thousand people could have easily taken my job and nobody would have noticed. But the big thing was the internet because it was the late nineties. And um, it's funny, all this sort of AI chat GPT stuff now, reminds me of that. It, every day there were articles, everybody's talking about it. And so I actually got involved in it really accidentally. I was just sort of standing in the right place in the company. Um, the cable company is who invented high-speed internet. It used to be you had to dial up. And so I just happened to whatever I was doing. I was the first um, dedicated employee in the whole company to the product, which at the time was just this weird side thing. And that grew and I got really involved in it. And so it was a great you know, sort of three or four years but 
it started to become just back being another product in the company. And so I was a little bit bored. I wanted to do more internet stuff. And so I just decided I would leave. Um, and I was going to build websites. Back then, that was the big thing. Everybody needed a website. Um, and it, it went okay, but not great. But at the same time, I like writing. I was involved in the internet. So I used to write this. It wasn't even a newsletter back then. There was really no such thing. It was just like a bulk email I sent to people in the company about stuff I found like Amazon or, you know, whatever. And when I left, I kept doing it. And maybe after like a year, year and a half working on my own and nearly not doing so well, people started to ask me to help them do a newsletter. And initially I was like, oh no, I, I can't help you. I'm busy like failing over here. <laughs> um, I mean, I didn't think it was an, a thing, but I slowly saw this was what caused people to call me up or refer me or invite me to lunch or to speak or whatever. And so it developed into sort of a product. Email was taking off. And that, although I'm sort of broadly not a marketing consultant, my specialty has been and still is email newsletters. And so I just sort of fell into it accidentally, but it's been a good match for me. Well, I wanted to bring up the topic of email newsletters with you, obviously, because they are still valuable, despite what some people might mm -hmm. say. Some people might say, oh, social media has replaced email yeah. newsletters. But talk to me about why email newsletters are still valuable. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's been an interesting sort of traje trajectory. When I first started in 2000, the biggest um, objection I'd get from a potential client was not enough of their clients or customers had email. Huh. And and then so it, it, it evolved over time. It used to just be email. But then like in 2005, the blog was invented. Now we could take the email and post it on a website in real time. And that was fine. And then when social media has actually worked really well for newsletters, because now you can take the stuff you've written and cut it up in pieces and sort of flow it through. So what went from just we send an email once a month, it now is it's an email, it's a blog, it's posted on your social people, myself included, record their newsletter now as a podcast. So to me, a newsletter is sort of the anchor thing. The hard part is writing it. The rest of it's just how can you spray this thing and reuse it in other ways? Um, I like it because, and I agree, there's been a, a portion of the population who've never liked it because it's too long and now it's old fashioned. That's fine. But it allows people to get a sense of who you are which you can kind of do in a tweet, but not a lot. But maybe more important, it allows you to say what you think and for me to see how you think and what you do. And so you need a certain amount of words. And so it's sort of a nice chunk. You know, my client's newsletter is maybe seven, 800 words. It's like a three minute read. Um, it's no longer the exciting thing. People used to come to me for newsletters just because they thought they needed one the way they do with social media sometimes, although they could never explain why they thought they needed one. Um, but it's been this sort of steady thing. I keep waiting for something to replace it, but I have not seen anything that sort of ticks all the boxes of personality, knowledge, comes every month, shows up in your inbox so you don't miss it. It's sort of a, it's just like a good, you know, blocking and tackling kind of tool. So still, have, still going. Well, my, my feeling about email, first of all, to earn a place in someone's inbox is sort of a place of honor. You know, like mm -hmm. a lot of people unsubscribe stuff that they don't want to receive. So if, if you can produce a valuable enough email newsletter that people are willing to receive month after month, I think that's, uh, that's, that's valuable to your brand. And that helps strengthen the relationship between you as the marketer and them as the recipient. And the other thing is that um, the fact that you send a newsletter every month and hopefully on the same day of the week, uh, the same week of the month, for me, that shows dependability and that's mm -hmm. part of your brand. So if you are dependable, reliable, consistent month over month, um, people will grow to trust you because they know that you deliver on your, your brand promise. So I feel that email newsletters uh, are, are, are very significant to this day. Yeah. I mean, and again, I would say sometimes people say, well, I don't like newsletters. And I'm like, hey, 
I don't like asparagus. <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't have to like, you don't need 100% of the population. Some people like, listen, I, I've been fine with my own newsletter. There's a portion of the people who subscribe who click to listen to the audio version, maybe 10%. Yeah. It's the same people because I can look and sort of start to recognize it. That's okay. So some people like to listen. I prefer reading because I, I, I can skim it. I can't skim a podcast. But um, as long as you have enough of a base of people who want to take that in. And again, if you're a small company um, in particular, where it's such a word of mouth thing, it, it, it gives you that foundation. And I, as you said, the fact that it repeats means that people start to get used to you and does lead to this whole sort of trusting you. It's a really interesting phenomenon how people feel like they know you, even though they've never met you over time. Exactly. Yeah. I would also venture to say that some people might not even read it at all, yeah. but they see it coming in and it it's like, oh, a ping. Oh yeah, that guy, he exists. And he's still, look at all the stuff he's writing. They may not even read it, right. but it, right. it reminds you. And so you remain top of mind. Whereas the person who does not do that may totally just fade away so that when the person needs what that person offers, they can't even remember your name. They don't have right. your email. Right. You know, the fact that you, again, that you're doing this, you're showing up in their inbox, then when they need what you're selling, they can reach out to you easily because they can find you in their inbox and, and contact you. Yeah, I totally agree. Because, you know, at any given time, most people don't need anything that anyone's selling. Like right. sometimes if I'm talking to an audience, I'm like, raise your hand if you plan to buy a refrigerator in the last 15, in the next 15 years. Like everybody yeah. raise your hand. And then like, how about the next 15 days? Nobody. Yeah. So the problem is I don't need what you're selling today. Right. I may, I may in a year or two years or whatever. And that's when I start thinking, well, who do I know who does this thing? Right. And this top of mindedness really matters in terms of someone at least giving you the call. So you and another call. thing works is uh, for word of mouth marketing. So if somebody contacts you, hey, do you know if somebody who does email newsletters? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Blue Penguin Development. Here, I'll forward you their email. I have their email right here. So. That's yeah. another reason. Boy, we're developing quite a list. I think we should make a listicle and put it out yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do people think that social media is going to replace email? And if not, how do email and social media work together? Yeah, so there's always, I get this question a lot, like is one, as if they're in competition with each other. But again, what it's allowed me to do, and I do this for my newsletter, my own clients, is we'll take the newsletter and then we'll take eh, maybe four or five excerpts from the newsletter, like, you know, one or two sentences. And that's what we run through their social media. And then we post, we, we uh, point it back to the newsletter, which is now a blog on their website. And so it lives on. And so it allow like a lot of times people say to me, oh, you're on LinkedIn all the time. Well, it's all automated. I'm just taking content I wrote and then it just kind of keeps stirring the pot of the stuff. Right. And I am on there somewhat, but not more than most people. But and what always surprises me is I could have a newsletter I wrote six months ago and there's still people commenting on it. Sometimes it's the people who have commented on the original newsletter. Yeah. But you catch them at the right time. And again, it has this this sense of you're out there. And if you're small, you need a way to scale your interaction. You can't you know, you can't do it on networking alone in person. There's just you know, not enough time. So the social has been really good because it's almost like given new life to what, what 20 years ago was. You send the newsletter. And if you signed up five minutes after I sent it, not only did you not see that one, you didn't see any of the previous ones because there was no blog. So it's really like I, I like it. And every time there's a new social thing, I'm like, great. One more place to put your stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I know. And. I feel that way about social media too, for one thing, because I'm very social as a person. Mm -hmm. So especially during the pandemic, you know, when we were yeah. all locked in at home, like I felt like a wild animal, like stuck in a cage, like, let me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I had social media where I could, you know, connect and co converse with, with yeah. people on a variety yeah. of platforms. So, yeah. so Michael, you have a book called the likable expert. Um, what, why is it important to be liked as an expert? 
Um, I think it depends on what you do. Like if you throw a baseball 100 miles an hour, I don't care what you're like at all. <laughs> so it, it's a function, I think, this sort of likability thing has to do with what business you're in. The thing is the opposite of throwing a baseball 100 miles an hour is you're a financial planner, you're a management consultant, a freelance writer, an attorney, a doctor. All those people, as good as they may be in what they do, the problem is I can't tell. Like, I've had the same accountant for 22 years. And if you said, is she any good as an accountant? I'm like, how would I know? Like, I haven't gone to jail. So <laughs> she's good enough. But yeah, I, right. even after working with her, no idea. So and when if you ask people, do you like your doctor? And they're like, oh, yes. But, you know, half the doctors in the country finish in the bottom half of their class. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a good chance you, yours is one of them. Never it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so... All these, all these sort of professional services in particular. The problem is, and I, it's interesting, I think the more hoops you have to jump through to become that person, the harder to, to differentiate. Like every attorney passed the bar, every doctor went to medical school. So the fact that you're an attorney, I know you've been certified. So the problem is, how do I know if you're good? Which is why to me, um, spending too much time claiming credibility based on um, degrees, how long you've been doing the, in the business. It's important, but everybody's got it. So the differentiator though, is I can tell if I like my doctor, I can't tell how good she is, but again, I don't think it really matters unless you're getting a heart transplant, but I know if I like her. And when I say likability, I don't mean that you just do whatever anybody wants or anything like that. What I mean is you connect with this person. And so I may like my doctor, you may hate her, but that's a. But in order for her to make sure she has clients who she connects with, she has to somehow demonstrate who she is more. And so, with newsletters in particular, I'm very big on you need to show the personal side because the other stuff that I can Google how to do whatever, which is fine. That's what your newsletter is going to contain. But the more you have who you are in there, the more you're going to attract the people who like that, and and frankly, push away the people who are like, no, nah, I don't like this person. So I, I spent a lot of time with clients, especially in the beginning when we started a newsletter, um, kind of drawing them out of their professional selves because there's this default of, oh, I don't want to be seen too crazy or whatever. Um, and, you know, varying degrees of success with different people. But I'm always trying to get them to tell stories, share a little bit of who they are, because I think ultimately that's, that's how people become to you. And that's how you end up with clients who are a good match for you. And so right. it's sort of everybody's better off that way. Yeah, I always say that a strong personal brand will attract the right people into your network and it will repel the people that you really don't want. And, uh, yeah. you know, you don't necessarily want to work with everybody. And especially if you're a solo entrepreneur, you probably can't work with everybody anyway. Right. right. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break now and uh, we'll be back in a moment to hear more from Michael. But I want to remind you how you to get how you can get a PR Maven things to do today, Pat. And Michael, you might just receive one in your mailbox. Wow. <laughs> but for the rest of you, if you would leave a review and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast player and then visit this link and submit your information. And we're, we're going to send you one of these amazing orange things to do fads in the mail. The, the, the mail, that's like the thing with the mailbox, not sure. your inbox. <laughs> Is that still a thing? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Last I checked, although <laughs> the way the postal service is going, oh, I hope it survives because I love the mail myself. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we'll be right back in a moment. Sprague & Curtis is a locally owned real estate company. We're primarily focused in central Maine. Uh, I got excited about Nancy's book because she's so well known in the area for her marketing and branding techniques and uh, we're always looking to expand and learn and grow and um, so a, a lot of us here at the office decided that we wanted to uh, read her book and learn some new techniques. It benefits Sprague & Curtis to have a large brand and audience um, because there can often be uh, multiple years between transactions with clients. Um, so it's important to network them with them and, and stay in touch with them in those in-between periods. And this book really helped us uh, learn some techniques and methods to, to continue to do that. 
We organized a small book group with Nancy's book uh, with brokers in our office this winter to share information and remind ourselves how important it is to always be working on our network and continually reaching out to our customers. Platforms like social media are important in expanding your business, but equally as important are handwritten notes, cards, letters. She inspired me to send her a note of appreciation, just thanking her for the book and her insight. In reading Nancy's book, I was excited to look to continue to grow our brand and our audience. I think she does a great job of um, motivating us. Nancy's book really helped me learn a few things in marketing and branding and how important it is to stay on top of reaching out to clients periodically, staying top of mind, providing useful information, and, and really telling our story as a company. So I want to thank my friends at Sprague and Curtis in Augusta, Maine. Um, we just launched that video because I had received a nice letter in the mail from Lori, who, Lori Doobie, who's in that video. And uh, when I got the letter, I, I immediately contacted her and said, let's make a video. <laughs> and she was up for it. So uh, that was awesome. So thanks. Well, we're, we're back with more from Michael Katz of Blue Penguin Development. Michael's... Uh, in Massachusetts today. He's in Hopkinton, which is actually where the Boston Marathon starts. And that's coming up in April, right, Michael? Every April. Yeah. Yep. On Patriots Day. Is that the day that the marathon that happens? Is, that is the day. All right. So this is where we're going to get into something that is new and in interesting and different. Michael, you have a theory well, there's a saying, do what you love and the money will follow. And you're not so sure about that. What are your thoughts? So I, that, that was my approach. In fact, when I went off to work on my own, I was trying to do what I really like to do. And, and you know, there's even there's books. I think there's probably a book. I think there is a book with that title. So yeah. I was a big believer in find what you really like and everything else takes care of itself. And, and that was what I would say, say to people. And I kind of thought maybe I thought that's what had happened with me. Um, but I, I sort of changed my view on that. Not that you shouldn't do what you love. The problem is, first of all, it's really hard for a lot of people to put their finger on that. It's like one thing I feel, you know, you're like LeBron James and you play basketball. It's like, well, <laughs> obvious. But I think for most people, there isn't, you know, this thing that equals I can make a living at it. And so right. also people, I think, get caught continually pounding on like, I love this thing. Like, you know making hats or something it but there has to be a market for it and all that and so it can be a distraction and this and then if it's not working you think well i'm just not loving it enough whatever um what i think is a better approach actually is to figure out what are you like really good at that that's hard too for a lot of people because again it's not usually i can play the guitar or play basketball as a thing that i'm the best at but it's easier for, I think, to figure out. And I'm always saying to people, I was just talking to a guy the other day who's been had a job for his whole career, kind of like I did 20 years ago, and is now trying to go off on his own. And my advice is, look, see if you can like really nail down, like what's the unique thing about you? It's not I'm responsible and I'm good at leadership. It's like too broad. So for me as an example, my real skill is writing, but not all kinds of writing. In fact, I'm not good at most kinds of writing. I can't write books or white papers or manifestos or direct response copy. I am really good at short format conversational writing in which I interview an expert and turn it into take their knowledge and turn it into something that someone else wants to read. It turns out that's what a newsletter is. The benefit of doing what you're good at, though, is you tend to like it. But not always. There's like the, you know, the neuroscientist who like becomes a circus clown. <laughs> but that, <laughs> like that person's an outlier. What I find is it's very satisfying to do work you're really good at because your clients like it. It's easier. Like if I write a newsletter for a client, I want them to go perfect or, you know, change these three words. If they said rewrite the thing, that's a problem. So it's like satisfying to do work you're good at. And so you like it usually as well. And I think it's a clearer path to figuring it out. And as important, if you need to make a living from it, you need to be good at it. It's not enough to like it. And so I'm 
that's my advice for people now. And as I look back on my own thing, even though it was really luck, because yeah, I just sort of stumbled into it. I wasn't doing it intentionally. The reason it's worked for me is because I sell a thing I'm good at. And so clients need you and they have they don't have a lot of alternatives. Like, you know, it's easier for me to get another client than it is them to find another guy who's going to do a newsletter the right way. So there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, so, yeah, the do what you love thing, I think as much as I've told people over the years, I think it can lead you down to a, a path where you're sort of not getting any traction and it's frustrating and all that. Yeah, well, if, especially if you're going to start your own business, mm -hmm. you need to have a, a, a some business acumen, too. I mean, whether you're making baskets or selling muffins or mm -hmm. starting a bookstore or whatever, you, you need to have some a business structure behind that. Um, yeah. So that's something to think about as well. I, I always think about how I got into PR and it was my father who's he passed in 2006, but um, he identified that I would be good in PR and, and he worked for Westinghouse electric corporation. Hmm. He arranged me to arrange for me to job shadow with the women in the corporate PR division in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I'm so grateful to my father because he, hmm. he called it, you know, and, and PR has been something I have loved throughout my career. And I'm so grateful yeah. that I found the thing. Right. Yeah, and you got to find the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, ha, you know, we've talked about your career path and have you have have you really loved what you've done or have you been happier and found more satisfaction since you've been running your own business? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I no kidding. I never made a cent that didn't come in a paycheck until I left my job. Yeah. And I never thought I would. Like there's no entrepreneurial anything in my family. My dad worked in the same company in the same building his entire career. I, yeah. I, I, got, I have two older brothers. One's a tenured college professor. The other is a partner in a law firm. Like we're not risk taking people. Yeah. And I, <laughs> and I was like on the same path. But I really think of my life as having two parts, the part before and the part since. And even though uh, when you work for yourself, it's it's not steady in terms of, you know, the highs and lows can be very extreme, even in a given day. Right. Whereas, you know, when I had a job, it was like a good day was like, I found leftover cake in the lunchroom. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was just like, here we go, another meeting. And that's okay. And, right. and by the way, it's not for everybody. But, um, and I don't think of myself as a risk taker, but I now, when I look back on the last 20 years, I've done something I really like to do. Um, in fact, um, retirement creates a problem because I'm already doing whatever I want every day and doing what I like. And so what else would I like? What else would I do? Yeah, right. I so I feel like, oh, why, you know, why not just keep going forever? Yeah, yeah, I feel that way, too. Yeah. Is there a book, a podcast or an app that have, has been helpful to you or inspirational to you and why? Yeah, and I, I wish I knew the author, but a book I'm reading a book right now. I'm almost done called Company of One. And it's about a guy who's talking about both the benefits and sort of techniques of, of working solo, but also scaling it. And I thought he had a lot of good insight. It's sort of the anti you need to keep growing book. Oh, like yeah. Even, even among people like us, there's people who will say, how are you going to scale your business? In fact, right. I don't hear it so much anymore, but people used to sort of um, describe what I do as a lifestyle business. Right. And I used to think, isn't that the point? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't scale. I work alone. I mean, I, I hire out some things like tech and design. But um, this guy kind of makes the point of why are you, why are you in business simply to um, monetize it or or to exit it and get a big paycheck. Why yeah. not just do what you want? So I, I found that very sort of both reassuring and also some good ideas about working solo and what the benefit is. So company of one, and I'm sorry, I don't know who, who's the author, but it's, it's out there. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you, Michael? Uh, the easiest is just michaelkatz.com. will take you, redirect you to my main website. Okay. See your website. Mm -hmm. And but you're you said you're also on LinkedIn. 
I'm on LinkedIn. That's my primary thing. And, uh, you know, it's under my name and I'm there and um, reach out. Happy to connect. Yeah. Well, as I said, you and I have been connected for many, many years. And mm -hmm. uh, and I must thank you. Uh, I'm going to mention this now. You referred me to one of the most newsworthy clients that I've ever had in my career. Mm -hmm. um, so you referred me to Stephen Church, who at the time had a China company. He made the memorabilia for the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate. Mm -hmm. And so he came to you wanting public relations assistance in the United States for that royal wedding. And you referred Stephen to me and so this is this shows the power of a referral from somebody who right. is, is trusted. I mean, he he hired me without even really right. interviewing me. And then that actually generated more publicity coverage for my PR agency than anything I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, and we were quite right. successful. Right. Um, and, and interestingly, I've never met Stephen. It's so funny. Yeah. I've talked to, I've talked to him, but never met him. So, yeah. Staying and in touch has, really so. He has a similar business. He does uh, email newsletters in England, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. Right. He's yeah, got, so anyway. I, I said you can have Europe. I've got the US. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's a very witty guy. And uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, he transitioned from Churches China over to email marketing. And hopefully he'll watch this uh, or listen to this podcast. And we'd love to have right. Stephen comment. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, this has been a real pleasure today. I'm glad that you were able to join me from Hopkinton, Mass. And I look forward to staying in touch and seeing what else we can cook up together. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Good to be here. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of the PR Maven podcast. I invite you to share a review of the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation on Facebook. It's free to join and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you use an Alexa device, use your Alexa app to search the skills and games section to find and enable the PR Maven podcast flash briefing. This will give you access to exclusive content and more PR and marketing advice. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.